Good evening, uh, Shane from Liberty Under Attack here. I hope you're uh, doing well. I'm coming to you today with a uh, very special interview. I'm joined by uh, Philip Frey from the Valiant Growth Podcast. His website is valiantgrowth.com. I came across Philip in the uh, Free Market Squad Fascist Book Group and uh, was put in contact with him uh, by Nick Hazelton, uh, who we've had on the show a number of times. Uh, Philip is over in the UK, and I'm really impressed by uh, his podcast. Uh, for that reason, I figured our listeners could benefit from his insight on a uh, number of subjects. So, without further ado, welcome to uh, Liberty Under Attack Radio, Philip. Uh, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, not a problem. Not a problem. So, uh, it's uh, obviously a pleasure to have you on the show. But uh, before we get started, uh, why don't you uh, provide a brief introduction of uh, who you are and uh, what you do? So, I'm a 23-year-old man. And I'm really briefly, I'm a very curious person. I, my two, I would say my two main hobbies are seeking the truth and developing my skills and potential. Okay, very good, very good. Um, so uh, um, tell, tell us a bit about uh, Valiant Growth. Uh, what, what are you doing over there? Yeah, so Valiant Growth is a podcast about personal development and it is my main focus at the moment and it encompasses a number of subjects and the reason why I created it was to to bring these subjects into the same place and these include questions such as uh, psychology and, and goals, productivity, personal finance, relationships. It's, it's a good mixture and I, I intend to to provide the complete package for people interested in, in, in building skills and doing personal development. And I'm more developed in some of the subjects and in others, I'm more of a beginner, but uh, I at least hope to uh, spark the interest of people and uh, provide some early steps. Very good, very good. So um, I'll ask a more more direct question on this uh, in a second. But how how did you get interested in I guess psychology and personal finance and, and financial independence? I mean, what what drew you to the what attracted you to these subjects? And was there anyone in particular that uh, I guess that sparked that could that create or spark that interest? I guess. Yeah, it uh, <clears throat> it came through through a number of uh, well a number of influences, and uh, basically it came as a response to to the challenges that I was faced with. So for instance, uh, I had no interest in personal finance until I was completely independent and having to run a budget and and uh, manage my own money. But then in that moment, I became extremely interested in it and, and I started <laughs> building skills in it. And um, I, well, when it comes to psychology uh, and, and kind of self-knowledge and those and relationships, probably the first person who yeah who who influenced me was Stefan Molyneux from from Free Domain Radio he had uh, uh, he had a great focus on these subjects especially in the past and I kind of went from there and uh, I, I explored on my own uh, Nathaniel Brandon has been another uh, another major influence and uh, yeah I kind of uh, picked things up as they were needed and uh, that's where I am right now. I'm, I'm I'm typically a curious person, and I enjoy learning. So, uh, I uh, I always have a lot of subjects that I, that I study. <laughs> very good, very good. So, so I guess a more specific question on this one: uh, um, and you identify as an anarchist, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Good. And how how did you come to this this uh, peaceful ideology? It might be pretty much the same answer as as the as coming to psychology and uh, financial independence and things. But uh, how how did you uh, how did you come to anarchism? What was your path? Yeah. Well, actually, the whole psychology aspect came through anarchism because um, uh, in well, my path to anarchism was basically through economics. I was. Uh, I was a student of uh, economics and business management, and in my first year, I, I gladly threw myself into uh, into the the subject of economics specifically. Uh, the old name for it would be political econ econ economics. So, 
questions of, of government and state and kind of big level questions. And um, I had I had a free market oriented professor, uh, one out of huh. 50. <laughs> he, he was the best. So uh, he gave me access to his kind of personal library. And that's where I, I started le- uh, reading Friedman, Milton Friedman and uh, Hayek and people like that. And I went from classical liberalism to to full on full on anarcho capitalism with people like uh, Rothbard and mm-hmm. David Friedman, and uh, and and through that I discovered Stefan, and through that the rest. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, I mean, I've I guess I I came through it more so on the it was it was kind of just like. Uh, more on the philosophy part, like, yeah, the, the state is, is an unnecessary evil, let's get rid of it. And then I segued into things like uh, Austrian economics and actually into the, I guess, the I guess the political philosophy and ethics that Rothbard discussed quite a bit. But, uh, but yeah, I was actually, before we did this interview, uh, I think it's the second day of Mises uh, University here in the States and in, in Alabama. So I've been watching, uh, <laughs> I've been watching uh, Mises presentations like all day. So that's, that's, that's very relevant. Uh, to what you just mentioned, but uh, but yeah, nonetheless, let's let's move forward to this uh, this next this uh, next subject here. Um, as you're well aware, uh, there's a wide span of content producers in the alternative media, uh, covering a wide range of topics. Uh, some are more respected, uh, some are more popular, and some are producing quality content and persevering well uh, on the grind of uh, growing their audience, which is which is where I would uh, uh, place our shows at this point. Uh, so so that said, how, how do you view content producers in the alternative media uh, or the uh, freedom movement, as you call it? Yeah, so I think I, I kind of envision it as as a funnel when it comes to content producers, and we, yeah, in the freedom movement and people interested in in free markets and um, yeah, in general freedom, we we're kind of delivering the same message with some variations, but but then you have people who are aiming for mass market. Uh, who kind of reach a lot of people and then there's a more kind of lower part of a funnel the more uh, it filters out some people and then we go into the the deeper stuff and more uh, evaluation of the philosophy more in-depth economics more in-depth personal relationships more in-depth philosophy uh, and that that appeals to yeah to the people who've already been uh, converted into this funnel yeah, and that that's actually that it's interesting that you that you that you mentioned that because I was I, I was considering writing an article because I was, I was talking to a colleague about it and <clears throat> so like you you've got the uh, I guess the uh, anarcho capitalist volunteer shows which fa- focus very heavily on the philosophy and they just do a lot of interviews mostly on the same stuff just the philosophy of it um, but uh, I, I do think there's a time and a place where people are like okay you know I understand volunteerism I I, under, I understand this this philosophy I adhere to it uh, now what can I do. Um, and that's where that's where I think where LUA is is, is here in the market is, is focusing on solutions. So um, it's yeah, I guess we we're kind of thinking that uh, I guess pretty pretty similarly. Okay, very good, very good. And uh, uh, where where do you think uh, where do you think value and growth value and growth fits into that into that funnel? Well, I think I think shows and kind of podcasts like value and growth are at the, um, kind of at the base of the funnel. Because uh, if if you listen to Valley and Growth, you will hear very little about uh, economics or politics or questions related to philosophy in general. And what what I aim to what I aim to deliver is for the people that kind of in in a similar way, in a way to to Liberty Under Attack, uh, whereas you give people ways to do kind of do direct action and to implement the philosophy in their life choices i i also try to to help them build skills that will enable them to to really succeed uh, both in their personal lives and and in spreading this message and why i consider myself part of that funnel is because uh, all the values and all the approaches that i talk about are strictly based on the idea of individualism on the idea of win-win relationships on the non-aggression principle and uh, questions such as these yeah 
and I, and I think your I think your show like uh, I guess maybe different than uh, than than Liberty Under Attack. I think your show you could even reach. I mean, you're probably even reaching folks that don't consider themselves libertarians or, or anarchists or anything like that too. So I think that's uh, I think that's definitely definitely valuable. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think LUA uh, has a, I guess a special niche there. I think we're probably really uh, near the near the bottom of the funnel. But because uh, uh, we don't we don't discuss a lot a lot of the shows will discuss like uh, the Libertarian Party and their advocates of that which whatever we talk about that enough on the show already um, but uh, like the Libertarian Party politics the news cycle uh, all that stuff and we don't really focus on that so uh, yeah I do see us at the the very bottom of that funnel too but uh, uh, but yeah when we when we were preparing for this interview you mentioned the front end and the back end to the Libertarian movement uh, it's an interesting way to put it and I'm not sure what it means can you can you speak to that. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's in, a, in a way a variation on the idea of the funnel, and uh, it's 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 similar in that. Who, if I want to be really technical, you might be familiar with these uh, uh, triangles from Austrian economics, where the more complicated an e economy gets, the more uh, the more steps are involved in the final product. So in the beginning, you just hunt the animal and that's it. But in the end, you have um, uh, you, you have uh, a rifle and the rifle is produced by a factory and that factory is made by a factory that makes factories. <laughs> it just, yeah, it, it goes out all the way. And, and I kind of see, uh, see people having different roles in this as well. So you have, um, again, you have the, the mass market uh, shows that that deliver the message of freedom to people that's kind of the final product but and that's the front end that's the that's the really we're producing the message of liberty and i think there's a back end and and i put valiant growth there uh, that that is interested in developing the people who then go on to to promote the message of liberty because yeah, if we have uh, unsuccessful people or uh, people who are not good at managing their time or finances, it's not going to go very far. We're not going to send a message of success to people. And I, I consider that there's a back end in building up the people. And there's also another part of the back end is the people who uh, develop the philosophy and the kind of the economics behind the more popular ideas. So when, when you go into a debate, you have solid ground and that's that's what i call the back end huh okay very interesting yeah yeah definitely uh definitely interesting so uh i guess uh let's move let's move forward to i guess i guess your your forte uh, uh personal development so uh, as per the trivia method it's always important to first define our terms even if i mean it's even if the terms are pretty self-explanatory such as this one but uh, how would you define uh personal development what does it mean to you yeah, well, I will say that there's no universally accepted uh, version of, like, universally accepted definition of what personal development actually is. But I would, I would, I would define it in opposition to technical skills. So I think personal development is the process of self-education in building skills that are broadly applicable throughout life and in different situations and in different times uh, whereas technical skills are highly focused and they're they're only usable in a certain context and i think mm -hmm. there's value value in both of them but i put personal development on this kind of broader broader place Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I agree. And in regards to what, in, in regards to what you said before, uh, it was it was before this last question. Uh, you're 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 uh, I guess like with with shows like what you're doing, you're you're, you're giving people the tools to live by example. Because um, I've I've said this I've said this before, and that's um, if if, if uh, um, obviously when we try to like, when I try to like, talk to my family and friends about anarchism, it doesn't it, it doesn't go badly, but it doesn't go well. Uh, to put it one way, but uh, um, I, I think living by example, and, and once once someone's practicing agorism, or, what, or if they're uh, I don't know, um, on the road to becoming financially independent, they're a lot happier. People are going to be like, huh, you know, uh, something, something's different about you. What, what are you doing? And then they, they, they ask the question and they're taking the initiative to find out what you're actually doing. So uh, I think that's, that, that's definitely valuable, especially in the realm of personal development, too. 
All right, and uh, welcome back. I had a little bit of a connection issue, but uh, what, what are you going to do? Okay, sometimes that'll happen when you're uh, recording over, over Skype. So, uh, but if you didn't miss anything, uh, I'll just ask the, the other question again, and uh, we'll, we'll get right back uh, right back into this. So, uh, why do you think personal development is an important subject for uh, anarchists and libertarians to look into? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think it's 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 an important subject for anybody to look into because these are the skills that make that make life enjoyable and that make uh, the the achievement of goals and also setting the right goals possible. But I think that in the case of anarchists and what did you, did you say libertarians yeah correct yeah yeah in the case of anarchists and libertarians i think it's especially important simply because of the great the the, the size of the goal that we have put forward and it differs from person to person and uh, some people want a free world and others would be happy just to have kind of personal freedom but either way, because of the size of our goal and because of how unusual it is and how radical it is and how pioneering it is when it comes to human thought, I think having very strong support systems and having very strong skills in, in managing your time, in, in staying happy and in handling difficult emotions, all of those are extremely important and and again especially for anarchists and libertarians uh, that's one thing and the other thing is uh, as always the most convincing argument is the person giving the argument like that's uh, logically that's uh, that's a logical fallacy it's an ad hominem but uh, in in reality and in practice uh, it's very hard to believe someone who well, it's very hard to believe someone who is is not is not happy, is not successful. Mm -hmm. That immediately takes away a lot of the strength of his message. And uh, I, the truth is, I see very many angry anarchists and miserable anarchists, and kind of um, yeah, kind of vicious or or kind of offhand kind of type anarchist and that's well that's not going to be it's not going to be convincing to anyone and um i think that's why personal development is is so important yeah 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 d d that's definitely true and, and two points on that the first one regarding financial independence and the other one uh, but yeah yeah you you definitely are correct and i mean i can't i can't blame them for for being angry for i mean but when i be when i when, i guess when i started the show last last february uh, I, I, I was, I was one of those angry people, but I wasn't an anarchist yet. But once I, once I found anarchism and I started, I started studying philosophy and I got that, that philosophical grounding and I started to kind of understand things a lot better. That helped, that helped a lot. But yeah, I do th see that on, uh, on fascist book a lot. There's some, some angry people out there and I can't say, I can't say I blame them. I mean, it's a monstrosity of a task they have at hand and it can be very, very disparaging when you consider how, as you're saying, how massive of a goal this is. Uh, and then the other one. And I, I talked to talked to this. Uh, I talked about this with uh, Jake DeSillis on financial independence, and that's that's something that you discuss on your show some too. And um, if if alternative media content producers became financially independent first, and then started producing content um, as as a hobby or whether it's just uh, I don't know a life a lifestyle business or something, uh, they would have a lot more time to devote to the alternative media. They'd have a lot more time to do podcasting, write books, whatever whatever their whatever their forte is. But uh, so yeah, I think that's that's definitely important too because uh, I know it's uh, uh, for me it's it's. It's hard with with all the other stuff going on in my life to do two shows a week and write a bunch of articles and all that stuff. So yeah, if I if I was financially independent, it would remove a lot of a lot of the stress that I feel in being a content producer. Much like I'm sure you you uh, you feel at times too. But uh, um, but yeah, so so I guess what what are the most important tools for personal personal development that that you've come across? If there were I don't know one two or three things that you would uh, recommend uh, people look into first, uh, what would those be? Uh, right. Well, let me just clarify here. Um, do you mean, I'm thinking, do you, do you mean tools for achieving personal development or the tools within personal development? Um, let's go with uh, tools for achieving personal development. Yeah, well, I think I think the best, uh, 
the best one your listeners have already discovered, and that is that is um, that is podcasts or or in general kind of audio content. Uh, I think that is a great tool for education and for personal development. Uh, yeah, and I would say in in general things like uh, books and audio books and YouTube channels are are great for picking up the information. So I would I would put that at number one. Uh, number two is um, at the moment fascist book to <laughs> your expression. Uh, I think that's it's very powerful because you can reach out to to people who share the same interests, and uh, I think that's absolutely key. Uh, because yeah, because of the pioneering nature of what we do, uh, it's it's very very hard not to be ground down at times. It's very hard not to not to feel really fatigued. It's it's an absolutely normal reaction, and and having people who who share that with you, and having people who can encourage you, and having people who who can help you go over a bump, or whom you can see how they handle it. Uh, that's very powerful. So I would say, yeah, Facebook groups especially are are a great are a great tool, and uh, yeah, so kind of. And and the third one I would say is doing some kind of introspective work. And there are a number of tools here, and uh, yeah, your your listeners can explore them on their own. But I would uh, just kind of the key words would be things like uh, journaling or psychotherapy or coaching or counseling that that can be very powerful yeah yeah very good yeah a couple of those things are on the food yeah journal journaling psychotherapy um i know meditation uh yoga and then spirituality are, are other aspects of, of of what you're what you're kind of discussing there but yeah in regards to fascist book i mean as much as i as much shit as i talk about it uh, it really is. Uh, I mean, it's a really, really good free way. If you aren't boosting posts, um, it's a really, really good way to to get content out there. And I've actually done better not boosting posts. But, uh, but yeah, I, I know whenever I became it, it was probably like May of last year, and I became an anarchist. And I I didn't have the community that I I guess that, that I didn't know that this community existed. And I mean, I I had I had people on for interviews, and that was nice. But they were all over the United States, and. I it, there's only it seemed like they were pretty scattered and then I went to the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest in August and then there's just an influx of uh, an influx of friend requests that I, of people that I met in Michigan and then after that like most of my friends list now is essentially uh, an, they're essentially anarchists and, and libertarians and uh, um, <clears throat> granted I didn't I don't delete people off my Facebook I think people just uh, some of some of the uh, statists just don't like a lot of the things that I a lot of the opinions I hold when regards to, like the American flag and and politics and, and all that all that fun stuff but yeah uh, facebook can definitely help with uh, with that isolation uh so yeah i agree it's it's definitely up there even though even i despise it for a lot of reasons uh it's still uh, i think an invaluable tool and if uh um, and and what we're trying to do and the message we're trying to uh um, get across to people of, of, of and uh, obviously i guess another aspect of that too is the uh, the culture jamming like the meme hacking like uh when when <laughs> like the, all the ta like there's a taxation of theft one a month or month and a half ago or something and there was it was it got it got ridiculous but uh it actually got that it actually got tr like uh, trending on google so i mean like there, there's just some things like that it's, it's such a great tool for just in for just uh um just disseminating this information and just forcing it in front of the eyes of people so uh, I, I think it's it's valuable for a lot of reasons uh even with uh with all of its uh all of its uh downfalls like the uh uh, like the censorship and uh, and all of that stuff. So, uh, I guess kind of on kind of on that same note, I know you're in the midst of a series right now titled "The Art of Stress-Free Relationships," and uh, I find your your last episode really really intriguing. Now, um, for those who didn't catch it, the subtitle was "Can I Have Friends with Radically Different Viewpoints?" And uh, boy, do I have some opinions, some opinions in that one. But uh, it's it's an important question. It's an important question. So before I provide my thoughts, I mean, what do you think? Do you think it's possible to have like uh, I don't know, like me being a proprietarian anarchist? Do you think it's possible for me to be friends with a with a uh, raging lunatic com uh, lunatic commie? Right. Well, um, <clears throat> well, probably not if I call him that. But <laughs> yeah, my my answer is no. But I have uh, it's no with a kind of a star or asterisk there because. Um, I, I use I use friends more strictly the word friends uh, more strictly than most people and I kind of separate relationships and 
uh, those those who listen to that series will will learn more about that. But I fundamentally split allies from friends, and allies are people whom you share some kind of goal or activity with, but who are not very close to you. Uh, you you're not a support network. You're not forming a support network together. So uh, if I can call you and uh, you know like I need a hundred bucks then we're kind of friends but if we're just I don't know drinking a beer together every month then we're more like allies or uh, yeah or or even even if uh, in this context right now uh, in in this interview we're allies and I think you can you can have allies that are not that have radically different viewpoints because because it doesn't matter you don't really need to trust them that much uh, I think that is the issue when it comes to friendships, because if you have people who are very uh, irrational in certain areas of their lives, uh, it's it's an ongoing risk because you don't know you don't know where it's going to show up. Like it's very hard to it's very hard to develop trust when uh, when someone is irrational simply because uh, things might be going great, but that it can then pop in, and and then you have no nothing to go back to nothing to go back to because people make mistakes people make mistakes all the time me you etc yeah that's normal but if we have at least agreed on a framework we can we such as rationality such as non-aggression such as uh, respect for one another such as win-win interactions uh, we can go back to that and and you know if i if i violate that somehow but we have agreed previously uh, you can say hey philip uh, remember, we agreed on this. Um, I think you kind of crossed that boundary, and then we can start talking about it. But if we haven't agreed on that, and for instance, with uh, like communism has a very win-lose view of relationships. Uh, so with the communists, basically, often if if you're doing well, if you're feeling really well in the relationship. Uh, they might see it that as coming at their expense. Uh, you're exploiting them somehow. That's that's a very real risk. And mm -hmm. because you don't have the same framework, you can't you can't say, "Hey, man, uh, this is not win-win anymore." So yeah, that's that's my take on it. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, that's yeah, that's 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 certainly an interesting interesting way to look at it. And, and obviously, no, I, I I don't associate with most people here where I live. There's I, a few few close friends and family friends, and then uh, obviously my my family. Whenever we go down south at our property in, in southern Illinois, but uh, generally, uh, especially being a, a student in higher level indoctrination in college, uh, yeah, I don't trust. I, I there's there's just no way that I could trust any of those people, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so as I'm, I'm glad you, you, you I'm, I'm, it's good that you, you hold kind of the same position as far as the friends, as far as allies. I, I still don't know. I still don't know because I am an advocate for security culture and and vetting, and people have irrational beliefs and they, and, and they advocate for Leviathan to to steal half of my income and things of that nature. Um, I see those as as violent individuals and also cowards because they won't, they aren't even man enough to actually commit the theft themselves. So I mean, there there's a lot of I guess there, there's a lot of different ways to look at to, to look at this, but uh, for me, it's it. I, I think it's just it's just it's just too hard. I'd rather have few people I can tr like few people I can really really trust than have I don't know some loose cannons uh, in the uh, friends arsenal. So uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, any any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say like if you like in certain relationships, it it, it simply doesn't make a difference. Like, like for instance, if you have a, a grocer who's a communist, in your practical interactions, it's not going to make make a big difference. Or if you have a piano instructor who's, I don't know, a fascist, uh, like you, d you don't really care so much. And is it preferable to have all anarchists? Generally, yes, <laughs> but. Uh, but it's not a, in in certain contexts. I think it's it's okay. And also, I think that there's also a kind of you you need to have, or I think it's valuable to have allies that allies in intellectual integrity, and and in so so people who have different viewpoints, who are kind of intelligent and who are reasonable debaters. I think it's valuable to have allies actually who have different views. I, I agree Just, with that. Yeah, you yeah. can you can keep yourself sharp and uh, 
yeah, and uh, see see where you're wrong. I yeah, that's right. yeah, I, I I agree, and I I uh, only associate with one constitutionalist now. Not necessarily my choice. They uh, didn't like some things I had to say at the end of last year, but uh, but yeah, I associate with one of them, and uh, uh, and I, I will say like that that's a, a valuable uh, I guess ally relationship, so to speak. Uh, simply because I mean I I, I understand I, I I do I guess I keep up to date with the uh, with the the arguments against anarchism and it actually gives me article ideas uh, as well the last one I released uh, um, the uh, uh, non-aggression principle explained for the layman like six or seven of those like refutations were literally from one conversation with this person so like it was just even if it's even if it's not for like uh if it's just like i guess a, i guess more of like a, a colleague relationship where we kind of help each other out with things um even even the the differing viewpoints doesn't really matter because uh yeah a lot of a lot of good material especially when people come from different ideologies it's also good not to get into that libertarian echo chamber that people like to talk about so all right. Uh, very good. Very good. So uh, I got just uh, a few more questions here for you. Um, so and this, uh, so you're in the UK. So I'm curious. Uh, what's the atmosphere there following the refer referendum in regard to Brexit? Uh, is it well accepted? Is there indifference? Has it been longer than two weeks and now people just kind of forgot about it? I mean, what's <laughs> what's what's the atmosphere like? Yeah. In in a way, um, it's it's definitely less on people's minds uh, now than 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 perhaps two weeks ago. <laughs> But um, and and I don't have a representative sample. Um, my yeah, my interactions are pretty limited and I, and pretty confined to certain people. But um, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion, and um, nobody see nobody was expecting it. Is is what my impression is. Like even the people who who were actually voting for it were not expecting to win, and uh, and kind of or or most of them were not expecting this to happen. It's kind of the uh, inertia effect. So so now that it has happened, uh, a it's very unexpected, and b nobody has any idea about the details of it. It's so unprecedented and. It will affect the lives of so many people in unpredictable ways, uh, including my own. I'm I'm an immigrant here, so that that have some serious repercussions. And uh, simply, there's just uh, there's just no certainty in in many many areas. So it's uh, kind of uh, ex a bit of excitement, a bit of fear, a bit of confusion. That's I think that's Brexit. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Huh. Huh, interesting, interesting. But yeah, we we discussed uh, secession on this past Sunday's broadcast of LUA Radio, so we we covered Brexit and that. And I I think uh, um, Gary Hunt has been following that, and uh, or he was following it. And he actually went and looked at the uh, I guess the the treaty or whatever it was the uh, the entry into the European Union. And um, so the the referendum, and then there's two years. I think they have to wait two years for to get their to get their stuff in order. But I think your your new prime minister said that. Uh, might ha they she might uh, push that back or something like that because they don't know what the hell is going to happen. Uh, so it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if there were some shenanigans because uh, obviously the the uh, the uh, I guess the European Union probably doesn't want Britain to leave, and uh, um, yeah, and politicians aren't trustworthy. So we'll have to see what happens. It'll be uh, it'll definitely be uh, interesting. And actually, I think I was also uh, in regards to the more broad broadcast. Uh, I think I was probably one of the first anarchists to come out against secession. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think secession is a good idea for, uh, uh, f uh a good idea for, I guess, anarchist libertarians to pursue? Yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. And, and I haven't listened to, uh, uh, yeah, to your, to your latest episode on that. So, um, kind of my, my default position is that, uh, the more local the government, the better. But I haven't thought a lot about it. So if you can not tell me the arguments uh, that you had against it. Yeah. Um, well, so I had in the first three segments, Gary joined us to lay down the legal arguments. I, I guess not. I guess the legal, like the legality of it, the history of it, and then also the ramifications from it. And I think uh, a lot of anarchists and libertarians do not like discussing use of force issues. That's why, like, it's all it's almost kind of a shell shock when we discuss things like assassination politics and uh, guerrilla warfare. Because most people, most libertarians, they don't like talking about that. It's just not something you're interested in. Ends up in New Hampshire. I mean, uh, Larkin Rose got some major backlash uh, from the Free Series because of Ben Christopher. 
Gamble actually got kicked out of the Free State Project or banned from all their events because he simply just talked about he he pr simply just extrapolated on Lark and Rose's uh, um, when should you shoot a cop? He just extrapolated out and said, yeah, I mean, like it's pretty much just reminding everyone of their right to self defense. So uh, yeah, if if they can't even discuss in the abstract and you look at the potential ramifications from secession. Um, and I don't remember all the historical examples that Gary provided, but they're like six six hundred fifty thousand dead in the last secession uh, movement. Like it's a really like it's it's a big big subject. And the issue I had is that I, I don't think a lot of people have actually thought this through all the way. Um, and and in regards to, like the pragmatic approach of it. Uh, but additionally, the the philosophical arguments, and this is what I did by myself, and or actually me and Danny did it in the last in the last segment. But uh, the philosophical arguments against. I mean, you look at you look at you look at Brexit. I mean, it was a referendum. There was voting. And we have a very strong stance against voting. Yeah, the second one is that still tearing at the majority. So those who didn't want to leave the European Union uh, in Britain, they're screwed. They are screwed. Like that, they I don't they don't have a choice in the matter. They're just gonna get they're, you're just gonna get dragged along with it. Uh, and then the, I think the third argument I provided was just simply the the fact that again the use of force the use of force issue. If they if they can't even think if they can't even talk about uh, assassination politics or guerrilla warfare in the abstract, and they they're advocating for for secession. And like it really does happen, uh, they aren't going to be mentally prepared to uh, to shoot government agents. That's what needs to happen, you know. So th that's kind of that's kind of where I'm coming from uh, in the matter. Uh, obviously, flesh that out quite a bit more uh, in the broadcast. But yeah, that that's kind of I guess the the quick uh, uh, the quick synopsis. Right. Um, yeah. So so based on that, yeah, I kind of I kind of would agree, or at least I would. Um, I, you know, I, I need time to consider it, of course, but I would definitely look into it because, yeah, you have this kind of axiom style observation that the more local the government, the better. Uh, and in theory, it is because you can hold your rulers <laughs> to responsibility <laughs> in, in theory, at least. Like you can set, uh, set the mayor's house on fire, but it's hard to go to brussels and do that but anyway uh, <laughs> um that's that's an interesting theory but when you look at the other side of um yeah you have a lot of violence you have a lot a lot of aggression uh the bigger entity is not usually not a fan of it uh i'm guessing that probably you uh, it, it, you have like to push it through it's never pushed through at least so far by people seeking liberty like that's always a minority it's it's usually pushed through by uh, nationalists and kind of patriotic and that localist forces and that's that's never good news for for liberty so and and that's that i think that was the situation with with brexit too as as much as you had liberty-minded people um, I, I believe that most people were were not voting on on these principles so yeah so so you have all these costs and you you end up with still having a government yeah yeah, that's that's true. That and I guess one one other, I guess yeah, two other things. Um, like the it, secession in the United States is kind of a gray area. Um, there have been a lot of secessionist movements, but nothing's ever happened with them. Um, so the the legality of it, I mean, it, it, it like I said, it's a gray gray area. And then for Brexit, that was specifically in the the entry document to the European Union. So like they, it was very very clear that they could do that. Uh, here in the United States, it's not it's it's not that clear. Uh, so I guess that that's one other thing to kind of uh, kind of look at too. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it's it's kind of fascinating that even though it was in it, uh, there's still so much confusion around it. So um, yeah, yeah, and I'm I sure I'm sure I'm sure a lot of those people didn't actually go read uh, go read the document too, because I mean that's that's how you find out the answers the answers are there. So I didn't I didn't read it, but Gary filled me in on it. So <laughs> I don't live there, so I don't have a huge interest in it. I just kind of yeah he, yeah he was more interested in, interested in it than I was. But uh, but yeah, and any uh, closing any closing thoughts on uh, on secession or, or Brexit? Yeah, well, another thing that comes into mind is that. Also, as far as so, so we have all of these things, so, so like it is from a purely kind of consequentialist uh, standpoint, it's a very dicey case to to be made uh, as far as liberty goes. And then you have the fact that it takes immense effort, like even if it's peaceful, uh, to convince a democratic majority 
and yeah, and and uh, the bigger entity not to destroy you. Uh, that takes incredible amounts of effort, and I think that's misdirected when we're looking at overall liberty. Like maybe maybe we can celebrate a peaceful secession if that happens, and that's cool, and we'll share it on fascist book. But uh, <laughs> putting our efforts uh, into it as a significant means to achieving anarchy is, uh, I think, that's very misguided. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't uh, it doesn't solve the problem of state as much as what I argued on uh, uh, on on Sunday. Maybe it, maybe it's a better pragmatic step. But whenever you look at uh, since 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 I mentioned that there was there's no like it's kind of a legal gray area. Um, I kind of had to guess at what it would be, and I use Texas as an example, and it had to be through the amendment process since it's a substantive change in government and the style of government, and. Uh, and this is where it kind of parallels really, really, I guess, badly, in my opinion, with state nullification, uh, wherein it requires, like, it, it, it would have to start out in the legislature. Two thirds by of the House and the Senate would have to, would have to, uh, and, like, propose the amendment. So it's not even the people doing it; it's it's the elected representatives. So the first step that would have to happen, and this would take so much time, and state nullification has been doing this for years. So they would have to grassroots lobby, run for office, and vote to get the right people into the Texas, Texan government just so that they could get it on the ballot so it could be voted on. Um, so it's it's really, really, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Their reformist means have, have not proven to be uh, efficacious, and Kyle Ridden, and Kyle, Kyle Ridden proved that in his, uh, in his last anthology. But, uh, uh, but yeah, any, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have. Cool. All right. So uh, I guess we, we can uh, begin to uh, to wrap this up. So what what can we expect from uh, Valiant Growth in the in, in the near future? What 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 are some some projects you're working on? Yeah, well, I'm continuing to produce content, of course. Um, I've been focusing on on relationships recently. So in the very near future, I'm probably going to uh, to switch um, to either productivity or personal finances. I'll have to see. But kind of bigger picture, I've um, recently started working on a book on personal development and uh, it's it's a little bit too early to to give a lot of details about that but it's it's something that uh, people can look forward to awesome awesome well uh, yeah i'm definitely i'm definitely looking forward to uh, treating that when it when that comes out and uh, we'll have to have you on uh, again whenever whenever that comes out and you can give us the the run through and uh, we can let the listeners know where to find that uh but uh all right fantastic so uh, any closing thoughts for the listeners before i let you go uh not really uh, i think you're uh listening to a great station <laughs> or a great podcast uh, depending on on how you do it and um yeah, I, I wish you the best, and I, I hope that I've sparked your interest in, in personal development and, and looking into these these subjects. I think it will benefit you immensely. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, well, th uh, that and uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming on uh, coming on tonight. This will air uh, on Sunday, so uh, uh, this well, I guess yeah, this Sunday's broadcast of LUA Radio. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for joining me, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll definitely have to get you back on again. Uh, you have a uh, great rest of your evening. Thank you. And no it problem. was my pleasure. <laughs>